Hello and welcome to the open day talk, virtual open day talk for marine biology and ocean weekly degree pathways. My name is Simon Boxall and I'm a missions tutor for oceanography and in a minute you'll be hearing from my colleague Anthony Jensen who is missions tutor for marine biology. So what do I do? I'm a physical oceanographer by training and I cover a wide range of areas. I look at seagoing work, looking at things like climate change and the impact in the Arctic, right through to using aircraft to look at oil spills, pollution, and even habitat mapping in the Venice Lagoon. In addition, I do a lot of work for outreach uh, in schools, public understanding, and do quite a lot of work in the media for um, documentaries as well as news items. Hello, uh, I'm Anthony Jensen. I'm the Marine Biology Commission's tutor. Uh, my research interests are mostly inshore, fisheries, artificial reefs, uh, marine benthic ecology in general. Uh, I coordinate uh, three modules and teach on another six or so. Uh, and as well as teaching about fisheries, I'm also part of the Southern Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. So um, I'm involved with real life fisheries management as well as teaching about it. So what is oceanography? Basically, oceanography covers all of the sciences of the oceans. It covers the mathematics and physics, looking at things like ocean currents, ocean circulation, climate change, increases in temperature. It covers the chemistry. It looks at things like carbon uptake, but also things like pollution, marine pollution, plastics, microplastics. It includes the geological processes of the oceans, not just for things like oil and gas exploration, but also for mineral reserves and the ocean bed itself. And finally, it does include biological processes. Marine biologists are basically also oceanographers. So the marine biology, marine biologists specialize in the marine biology side of oceanography. It's not just about the fish and the plants. It's also about the ecology. It's about their habitats and about their behaviors. And this brings in aspects of the physics and chemistry. You can't really understand the biology of the oceans without understanding things like nutrients, understanding how currents move things around. This, is all take, this all takes place at the NOC, the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. It opened in 1995. There are around about 460 staff. And these are staff in science, technology and engineering. On top of that, we have about 700 students both undergraduate and postgraduate. It houses the Natural Environmental Research Council alongside the University of Southampton. And between us, we account for about 50% of the building each. It's internationally recognized as a center delivering quality research and teaching. And this is really important. It means you're being taught by the best people in the world. It's ranked as pretty much in the top three or four worldwide and is also the largest centre of its kind in Europe. The other big advantage is the base for the UK National Research Fleet and other facilities like the Deep Ocean ROV ISIS and our auto subs. This means that not only do you get to hear about these developments but you can actually go and see them and talk to the engineers and staff the work on them. There are 30 of us contributing to the oceanography and marine biology degrees. We are uh, oceanographers, um, so we teach marine biology, marine physics, marine chemistry, marine geology. Uh, and this allows us to provide a good quality degree with a strong interdisciplinary flavour, something that uh, is much favoured by employers. Our teaching is progressive. Each year builds on the one before. So for Bachelor of Science, we offer uh, five degree programmes, three uh, marine biology and two oceanography. Um, the three marine biology programmes reflect the amount of interdisciplinary marine science uh, within each programme. So biology with marine biology has a very strong terrestrial and marine biological uh, aspect with um, the smallest amount of interdisciplinary science that, that we teach. Marine biology, if you like, is in the middle. Um, so focus very much on marine biology, but with um, a, a sensible amount of uh, interdisciplinary marine science to um, support uh, the uh, greater marine focus. And then marine biology with oceanography has the most access to the other oceanographic sciences. Uh, particularly in years three and four. 
in our Oceanography Single Honours Programme, um, we expect you to um, make your module choices so that you're predominantly looking at uh, physical, chemical or um, geological oceanography. Or if you like, you can mix them up and do uh, about the same amount of, of each of those subjects. Oceanography Physical Geography is uh, a, a degree we run with, as the name suggests, uh, geography. And this is quite a popular degree. I think people who uh, aren't quite sure uh, what oceanography is all about um, and enjoy geography quite often take this, uh, this option, um, particularly in year one. We do see quite a number of people transferring into the full oceanography program later on. In the uh, Integrated Masters Programme, the MSI, the four-year uh, undergraduate degree, um, you'll see some familiar titles. Uh, so these are just the four-year versions of um, the, the marine biology degrees uh, and the oceanography degree. Um, the difference here is obviously the final year where you're working at the master's level. Your research project is twice the size of the, the BSc project, twice the length of the BSc project and the modules that you're taking are level seven uh, modules, so uh, at a much higher level than the final year BSc modules. There are a, a few different titles here. Uh, we run a study abroad program for both marine biology and oceanography. Um, this is, uh, both these programs you enter at the end of year one, um, and entry is based on your grades, and we're only going to invite the uh, students with the highest grades at the end of year one to join these study abroad programs. Um, the study abroad is focused on uh, universities in the USA uh, and in, can include uh, University of North Carolina Wilmington um, and um, uh, Rizontio School of Ocean Marine Science in, in Florida and so on. So uh, there's quite a range of, of universities to choose from. I think uh, the degree with the difference for me is Oceanography with French. Um, this is a program where uh, we like you to have a good knowledge of the French language, uh, either um, sort of a bilingual through your family or, or A level. And um, here you'll do um, your first two years uh, in Southampton, and then you'll go to Bordeaux for your third year, uh, and then come back uh, to uh, complete your uh, your MSI in Southampton. Um, it's not a very large degree, um, but people who take that have a, an amazing opportunity to move into uh, multilingual uh, European science, and uh, a number of graduates have got really great jobs out of that degree. Now, we don't expect everybody to get their degree choice absolutely spot on uh, first time round. So we build in flexibility between our pathways. Um, at the end of year one, uh, you can move between all of the marine biology pathways uh, and some at the end of year two. And the same goes for the oceanography degrees as well. What you can't do is move between marine biology and oceanography. And because biology and marine biology is a bit special, you can move uh, either towards the more terrestrial side and look at the zoology and conservation degrees within biology or move towards um, a more marine degree with marine biology, both of those at the end of year one. So coming to entry requirements, so we have some preferred subjects, so biology, chemistry, physics, maths, environmental science, geography and geology are our preferred subjects. And the standard offer for our MSI degrees are uh, AAB at A level uh, with two preferred subjects. So um, say uh, biology and chemistry with French uh, would be absolutely fine. Uh, and for the BSc an ABB with two of those preferred subjects. So again, um, physics, maths and geography would be absolutely fine because you've got three preferred subjects there. Um, you can also enter the BSc through the Science Foundation year that we run at Southampton and with access. And if you want to contact me, 
uh, if you have any questions about that I'll be happy to uh, answer them. It's uh, one of the nice things that we're starting to see EPQs recognised uh, within the university system and so uh, an EPQ project at an A grade or better will reduce the le level of your offer uh, by one grade uh, and equally we're now seeing contextual uh, offers within the UCAS system so um, that, again that's something that Southampton has signed up to and we also have our own access to Southampton um, summer schools uh, which uh, result in a reduction of one A-level grade in your offer. When do we do this? Um, standard semesters starting late September, early October, running through to just before Christmas, um, an exam period just after Christmas, and then start of semester two, taking you through to the Easter vacation. Uh, where you have a four week period. Um, I won't call it a break because certainly uh, year three and year four students are pretty busy during um, that period and we do use that, that, that vacation for field courses. And um, then after Easter on to um, finish off semester two exams and then the summer vacation except that of course we use chunks of the summer vacation for field courses as well. So uh, it's a pretty busy year. I think uh, the workload is uh, a fairly classic science degree workload. Um, at Southampton, you typically do four modules per semester, which is round about 23 hours of contact with academic staff every week. And we'd ask you to do another 20 or so hours independent study coursework and that sort of thing every week as well. So it's roughly a 40 hour week. Our first year lectures are usually timetabled up at Highfield, um, but we will be running our practicals down at Knox. And so to move around, you use the Unilink bus service, um, which links all bits of the university to all other bits in the university. And if you're staying in halls, the costs for the bus are, are covered in your hall fees. We aim to have all of our second, third and fourth year modules down at Knox. It doesn't always quite, quite work like that, but in general, that's what happens. Practical work is really important to oceanographers and marine biologists alike, and it's also great fun. Within SOIS, during the term time, you'll have units which include a lot of practical work on the water. But on top of that, we have a number of residential field courses. Some are compulsory, some are optional. In year one, you have a compulsory course based in Southampton, and this is testing your skills in terms of small boat handling, scientific boat work skills, chart work, but also it's giving you the right pieces of paper for survival at sea and first aid. So you'll be qualified to go on to proper professional boats once you've completed this field course. Those bits of paper are fundamental to all the work you do. In year two, the beginning of year two, um, the marine biologists go off to Dale Fort and here they have a compulsory course looking at um, sampling and ID skills on the shore side. They also develop a small group research project and start to work in teams. On our main field course, which comes into year three, but actually happens right at the end of year two, right at the beginning of the summer holidays, um, we have oceanographers and marine biologists coming together and they spend 10 to 12 days working in Plymouth. Here you'll be working in groups of about eight. Uh, you'll be independent. We'll be there to help you. But basically, you're now learning to work as a team and to work independently. The work you do involves everything from offshore in the open ocean right through to up the estuary. We work with four vessels down there, about 30 staff, and it's an intensive few days. But it's a time at which you really bring together the learning you've had in the first two years into your oceanography and marine biology. In year four, for those doing the master's course in oceanography, there's another compulsory course currently in Falmouth, but it is moving around. And here you're basically given as a team of about eight people um, the use of Callista and its equipment for about four days. You then decide what you're going to do and you go offshore and you work together. We'll be on board to help you, but fundamentally it's down to you. From that, you develop a research program together and you then produce a report. This is compulsory. All of these courses so far are free. 
So once you've paid your fees, you're in Southampton, these are part of your course. For the marine biologists, uh, these are people doing marine biology, marine biology with oceanography, and all the other variants. Then you also have an optional course in year four on tropical marine ecology. Um, this is about 10 days. Uh, it actually happens at the end of year three. And there are two options running at the moment, but that does vary. The first is working at Galop Galapagos at the Universidad de San Francisco de Quinto. Um, and the second one is a new course being run in Thailand at Nayang, uh, Phuket. Um, both courses do have additional costs. The Galapagos one, understandably, is quite expensive. You've got airfares out there, and it's about 2800 The one in Thailand is a bit cheaper, as living costs and travel are cheaper as well. Part of our students' degrees. Uh, they take up 25% uh, of the BSc final year and half the MSci final year. And there are an opportunity for our students to uh, research something that they're personally interested in, uh, and it's an opportunity for them to demonstrate how much they've learnt in terms of uh, literature, field, lab and writing skills over uh, the course of their degree. Projects are developed with academic staff. Uh, students will go to a relevant member of staff with an idea and between them they'll work up a project that will um, work within the um, the time frame available and also with the finances that are available. These projects often involve work in the summer vacation between um, in the summer vacation before their final year and um, how that works out is, is purely down to the uh, agreement between the student and the supervisor. Now whilst most of our projects are based in and around the UK, uh, quite a lot along the south coast of, of England, some of our students do choose to go abroad and we support and help the students uh, with these projects as much as we can but it does put an extra element of responsibility on the student to make sure the data they collect can be worked up uh, and written up well uh, when they get back. One such project it was done by Lydia Woods this academic year uh, and I was supervising it. And Lydia has very kindly made a video to uh, outline uh, what she did in her projects and what the, the conclusions were. Hi, I'm Lydia and I've just finished my final year doing MSI Marine Biology at Southampton. That is the integrated, integrated master's course, uh, which was four years. Um, and I was initially attracted to study at Southampton um, because like many people, I visited the NOC um, and I saw the facilities they had, two boats, labs everywhere, an aquarium. Um, and it felt like there was current research going on, which I thought was quite exciting. And then I was also inspired from watching previous students' presentations of the field work they got to do in their degree and different things like that. So I've included this picture. Um, I think that's me in on the Galapagos trip doing some sort of snorkeling survey. Uh, but field work has definitely been a highlight throughout the degree. So I chose to do my final year project with Operation Wallacea, which is an organisation that runs expeditions for students to collect data outside of the UK. Um, and I chose to join their Caribbean project, um, which was about cleaner shrimp. So that blue shrimp is the Pedersen cleaner shrimp, which is the subject of my study. And they live on these corkscrew anemones. The anemone actually hosts the shrimp in a symbiosis, which forms a cleaning station. So fish will arrive at these anemones. The shrimp will jump on them and remove parasites and dead tissue, and they improve the overall health of the fish. So. I wanted to study uh, the fact that if you return to the same cleaning station again and again, the number of cleaner shrimp on it can actually change. It doesn't always, but it can over time. Um, and I wanted to study how this would affect the number of fish uh, arriving to be cleaned or the behaviour of the shrimp. Um, and then the second focus was aggressive neighbour species. So sometimes these host anemones can grow in the territory of a damselfish. Um, and damselfish are notoriously aggressive. They will chase away any intruders onto their land. Um, and the anemone can also host these skinny crabs <laughs> called yellow line arrow crabs. Um, and so both of these and damselfish can be aggressive and might disrupt cleans in some way. So I asked Anthony to be my supervisor um, and he helped me to design the project to make sure I was collecting robust data. 
that we can analyse. And he also helped me with the health and safety side of things before I left for the Caribbean. So my study site was the Caribbean island of Utila, which is part of Honduras. Um, so Operation Wallacea has a research centre on the island <clears throat> where the arrow points. Um, and in front of that is Coral View Reef, which is the study site of my study. Um, and we often saw eagle rays and there were even whale sharks in the area, which was cool. OK, uh, so to collect the data, we had already nearly 100 corkscrew anemones identified on the reef and we tagged them so that we could return to them and count the shrimp. So we dived nearly twice, a, well, we dived twice a day for five weeks um, and we were, each dive we tried to count the number of shrimp on as many anemones as possible, um, but we couldn't do all of them in one day, there was too many. And also on the first dive we would put down three cameras at three different cleaning stations, press record and then leave. And then the second dive we picked the cameras up and then on back on land we would watch the footage uh, for cleans. And in the bottom right corner you can see the sort of thing we would see. Um, so a fish has come to be cleaned and as soon as the shrimp touched the fish's body that was when the clean began and as soon as the shrimp left all the shrimp had left that was the end of the clean. Um, so we recorded the details such as the duration of the clean uh, in minutes, what species of client fish it is, what the size of the client fish is and whether the client was actually a predator of the Pedersen shrimp or not. So when I was back in Southampton, um, I met with Anthony, my supervisor, every other week, and he helped me uh, look at my data, uh, what statistical tests to use, what graphs to make, and basically how to write the dissertation. Um, and from that, I ended up finding that the changing number of cleaners on an anemone had no significant effect on the cleaner or the client behaviour. So that really didn't change much about cleaning interactions, but the aggressive neighbour species at cleaning stations with aggressive neighbours, um, there were significantly fewer cleans per minute of footage, as this box plot shows, um, and I think this is because they were being chased away by the damselfish, so there were fewer fish were able to be cleaned. The client fish that were cleaned, they were actually smaller than at stations without aggressive neighbours, um, and the Pedersen shrimp performed shorter cleans when aggressive neighbours present and I think that is because they were actually interrupted <laughs> by these aggressive neighbours. So looking back over the four years of my degree at Southampton I think the course has given us a broad experience of all the different disciplines of marine biology um, from molecular stuff in labs to ecology and survey stuff so it's definitely the right place for marine biology um, and the uni itself has many societies. Uh, the obvious one is the scuba diving one for marine biologists um, that is me on the left um, and they have good trips and stuff like that so that's definitely been a good part of my degree um, so that is the end of this presentation and hope thank you for listening and hopefully it helps you decide what you need to go to uh, bye so i hope that gave you some feel for the uh, type of project that uh, our students can do uh, we haven't marked Lydia's uh, dissertation yet, but I'm sure it's going to be a good one. I've seen some drafts. So eventually you get to the point of graduation and our statistics for 2019, uh, the last graduation, were really good. Over 87% of our students graduated with a 2-1 or above. You'll notice that the MSIs seem to have more 2-1s and 1sts than the BSCs, or rather more to the point there are 1 or 2, 2-2s two and 3rds and the BSEs, that's mainly because you need to be getting a 2-1 to continue into the MSI. Um, people often talk about grade inflation. In reality, all of our degrees are um, moderated by external examiners from other universities running similar courses. And so we are, so if you like, compared with universities across the country. So this isn't grade inflation. We really do have some of the best students, and it's great fun to work with them. Employability. Having graduated, an important part. Um, we are, I suppose, steered by what we call Unisats. This is the government statistics. And they look at the um, number of students who are in degree level employment or study six months after graduation. Now, this relies on A graduates replying to the survey. And a lot of our students tend to take a gap year or they're waiting to start PhDs, particularly if they're looking to start in the US or in Europe. Um, about 20% of our do take further study. So the 2018 data, which is the most recent, shows that oceanography degrees averaged 75%, marine biology degrees averaged 82 
That Lobo Shrography was primarily down to five of my own students going off together. They made great friends together uh, over the degree course, deciding they're going to take a year out before starting PhDs. And four out of five of them are starting PhDs this coming autumn. There's a strong careers service within university which literally runs from when you start on day one right through to the end of your working life and it's there to support you whenever you need it. They'll start with day one not to make you think about what you're going to do when you graduate but mainly to think about how you're going to develop your CV, how you're going to get things like summer jobs, maybe even term time jobs. So they are a great resource uh, that you should use. Um, we also have an annual careers day event every year. Um, this brings together our alumni who come uh, from their various companies, about 45 organizations, uh, industrial organizations and government organizations come to talk to our students and they're looking to recruit. Um, and every two years we have the big ocean business event. That's the equivalent of our big international car show or a big international boat show. And we have over 180 organizations from around the world. And on one of those days, there's a special day looking at careers as well, right on your doorstep. Some students fly in from other countries just to be there. There, here, is on your doorstep. So what do students do? Some go into further education, masters and PhDs. As I said, 20% of, of the 2018 cohort did. Some do research at universities without the PhD and work in government laboratories, the Environment Agency, CFAS, NERC and so on. A lot of go, in, go into a consultancy role. Um, there are a number of consultancy roles who do work for governments. For example, the search for MH370, the missing aircraft, wasn't actually taken, undertaken by the Australian and Malaysian government but by a company called Fugro Geos, and some of our students were involved with that. Um, environmental NGOs, um, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, have oceanographers and marine biologists on their teams, and mainstream industry and commerce. Not just oil and gas, but offshore energy. Uh, a lot of them investment at the moment on things like tidal energy, offshore wind farms. That involves oceanographers and marine biologists looking at not only how does the environment impact on the work, but how does the work impact on the environment. Conservation of fisheries is an important part of the marine biologist's career. And in fact, there's a range of careers where the numeracy and scientific training is valued. A lot of our students go into teaching, and actually, Oceanography and Marine Biology provides you with a good science base to go into teaching. Application process. Well, the applications will open from September. Um, we will receive your forms and evaluate your grades and potential. We need to make sure you've got the right subjects, as Anthony discussed. Um, and those subjects, grades and personal statements do matter. Please keep in mind we do need those grades. If you're a long way predicted from those grades, then you really need to come have a chat with us. Having received your form, we will either give you a conditional offer if you're looking at the MB pathways, or if you're looking at oceanography pathways, we will um, ask you to come to an interview. We want to make sure it's the right course for you and to make sure we match you up with the right course. Um, the MB pathways have an op option of a visit day having got an offer. Eventually, um, spring, um, in the year before you start your degree, you need to either choose your conditional firm, your first choice, and the conditional insurance, your backup choice, from your five original UCAS selections. The A-level results are results released in mid-August. Then we have a look at all your results. One of the advantages of the interview is that it gives us a chance to be more flexible uh, when it comes to your results. So why study oceanography or marine biology, or both, at Southampton? Hopefully, we've given you a good insight in this brief talk. But do come and talk to us more if you want to find out more. It's unfortunate we don't have um, our sort of face-to-face -face open day at the moment. Um, these are exceptional circumstances. But we can answer questions, come online in one of our virtual open days, or give us a call or drop us an email. We're here to help and support and to answer those important questions. You can follow us on Facebook, and there are lots of more stories about the Southampton Oceanography student experience. Um, and if you need to contact us directly, please do. For Oceanography Pathways, contact myself, Simon Boxall. And for the Marine Biology, Marine Biology with Oceanography, and Biology and Marine Biology, please contact Anthony Jensen. Our details are here. We hope you have a great summer, and we hope we might see you sometime in the near future. Thank you.